Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a welcome also to those who are watching on YouTube. Welcome to Leeds Minster. My name's Paddy Benson, I'm on the staff here, and it's my privilege to welcome our speaker this evening. Before I do so, a quote. The British people deserve to know which party is serious about stopping the invasion on our southern coasts and which party is not. Let's stop pretending that they're all refugees in distress. I'm utterly serious about ending the scourge of illegal migration. Many of us were quite struck when we heard our Home Secretary make that remark in Parliament recently, and it rather raises the question of the values that we want to live and embody in our public life. And so it's with particular relevance that we're going to be listening to our speaker this evening. Chris Baker has been described for us there. He's uh, the William Temple, Pro Temple Professor of Religion, Belief and Public Life at Goldsmiths and also the Director of Research in the William Temple Foundation. A couple of quotes of things that he's said that he's passionate about. He's about the newly visible role and impact of religion and belief in public life. And unpacking that a bit further, in public policy and social welfare and in civil society. Has there ever been a time when such a subject was more relevant than it is now? Chris, it's a great privilege to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, Paddy, for your very warm welcome, and thank you all for coming out to this lecture on uh, a fairly wild and uh, windy evening. Uh, I think those of you watching from home have definitely uh, drawn the long straw. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you very much, uh, Helen, as well, for inviting me to take uh, this year's uh, lecture. So, as Paddy said, um, I just want to, before I start, I just want to say a little bit about the role that I play, because in a way it explains, I think, I hope, uh, what, I'm going to, what I'm going to say this evening. So I'm very lucky, I'm a very lucky man. Uh, and why am I a lucky man? Well, because I'm being paid by two institutions uh, to do what I really passionately enjoy and uh, relish, which is uh, studying, reflecting upon, writing about um, lived religion, and lived belief. So I'm not that really interested in what people say they believe. I'm much more interested in how they live out what they say they believe. And I'm able to do that from a platform that's both secular, i.e. Goldsmiths. Uh, and if anyone knows anything about Goldsmiths, it doesn't get much more secular than gold, than, uh, as a university than, than Goldsmiths. Um, but then also the William Temple Foundation and really, so basically, when I talk about religion and belief and change in public life, because it's, it's always fluid, it's never static, um, I'm able to do that from both a secular and a religious perspective. And I, I try and speak into both communities at the same time. So really, the hook lecture is ideal for me because the, 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 the very specific brief I got from Helen was to say, well, look, there'll, there'll be people of faith in the audience, there'll, there'll be people from university, uh, there'll be people from policy and public sector. So that's basically how I'm going to try and reflect on what I see as the huge shifts that we're going through as a society. Um, some people are calling it an age of uncertainty, you might say that's, that's probably the understatement of the year. Um, and but you know, where, where is religion landing in this? Where is belief landing in this? And I tend to use the words religion and belief because actually I'm as interested in those who say they're not religious uh, as those who say they are. Because as I will show you um, a little later on, I hope, there's, there's a huge amount of work going on on the identity of those who define themselves as non-religious. And it's, it's much more complex, maybe, and, and rich than you might, you might uh, be, be led to believe normally. I'm just taking my watch off so I don't go too far over my time. Um, that's the, uh, the slight problem of not having notes. You, you tend to lose track of time a bit. Anyway, 
Thank you. So thank you very much for coming, and I'm really looking forward to sharing some of my thoughts with you. Um, partnerships for real, real change, harnessing political and spiritual yearning in an age of uncertainty. So I'm going to give you my arguments up front, just in case you, know, you find yourself nodding off after half an hour or so. Uh, I don't think you will, but just in case you do. So uh, what, I, what I'm going to lay before you is the idea, and all this is you know, up for contestation and, and critical debate. I'm suggesting that the existential nature of the political, social and economic challenges now facing us have admitted a strong spiritual or non-materialist element into our analyses and problem solving in the last 20 years. But I think that has accelerated since the pandemic. This has rekindled a strong interest in religious and spiritual ideas that is being increasingly conducted upon, beyond the curtilage of institutional religion. So within that statement is a kind of implicit, uh, I wouldn't say critique, but a kind of wake up call <laughs> to those of us who, and I, I include myself as an Anglican, who kind of sit in the space of institutional religion. Um, how confident are we that we're managing to engage with all this, this searching and this kind of search for what I'm going to call authenticity and re-enchantment going on. So I think that that's, it's brilliant what's going on out there, but I think it's also a, a challenge to us to make sure that we, we're engaging with it. And then this was, the, this was a tweet that I tweeted uh, just before coming here, and it's sometimes the discipline of a tweet manages to kind of condense things in a way that are, that's, that's helpful. So actually, when I, when I thought, well, what am I going to say tonight? This is it coming together on the basis of shared values across difference will be a major policy tool as we seek to rebuild a shattered politics and restore faith in our public life. The reason why I say major policy tool is because, you know, I'm of a certain age where I kind of, you know, when you talked about common values, it tended to be rather niche settings like, I don't know, interfaith fora or, you know, deanery synod or deanery chapter meetings. This, this, this debate can no longer afford to sit in rarefied spaces. It, it needs to come in to the heart of our public life. And I'm pleased to say, based on some of the research I've done, that's actually what's happening. So I'm going to share some of that with you as well. Now, I said at the beginning that uh, I have a foot in two camps. I have a foot in a secular uh, tradition. I have a foot in a theological tradition. So I'm afraid to, you know, that the way I'm going to see what, what the elements of this, uh, of this space that we now find ourselves in, um, you know, they're going to be, some are going to be uh, secular sources, some are going to be the theological. So I hope that's okay for everyone. I hope if, you're, if you don't class, classify yourself as a theologian, uh, that, you know, when I talk theology, it kind of resonates and ditto. Um, when I talk about policy and so on and so forth, it resonates, even though you might not be living in that world. So for me, the elements of the argument, or how have we arrived at where we are? I think there are five, five drivers. I mean, there'd be plenty more, but these are the five that I like to work with. So the empirical evidence of what I'm talking about is for example, the way that partnerships between religious and secular agencies developed in response to the emergency of the pandemic in the first lockdown uh, and have continued through the second and third lockdown. So um, it's happening as far as I'm concerned. That, that's exciting. Uh, the second element is, is a general return to values. The desire to... Um, almost as a kind of counterintuitive exercise against the current politics. It's, it's that desire to restore public life to values, to connect our shared common life to values. When we've, it seems to me that we've, we've lived the last few decades with, with that sense of, well, we don't need values, you know, it, it's the market, it's whatever it is, it's, it's science uh, that, that, that shapes what we do. Um, and some people are saying, well, values are the new religion. So if values are the new religion, 
um, what are the implications of that for us? So there's a bit of sociology there, sociology of religion. A post-secular age, I'm saying. I think some of you may have worked with this idea, this, this framework. But although it's been around for 20 years, I, th I think it still has the um, ability to kind of jolt people out of their complacency. But you know, surely we can't be living in a post-secular age. Surely we must be living in a secular age. Well, well, well let's, let's discuss what, if the idea of post-secular helps us to understand some of these big shifts that are going on. And then theology, well, I just brought this in because I love this idea of anatheism, the search for God after God. Um, this isn't, obviously, this is something that applies to Western thought and our Western understanding of the, uh, the idea of God, how the idea of God has shifted from a theistic idea to an atheistic idea. But now uh, the guy who came up with the phrase, Richard Carney, who's an Irish uh, philosopher of religion, says we're entering an anatheistic age, a return to God after God. And I'll try and explain what that, what that means. And then I think what the, 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 where the rubber hits the road, and this is a kind of, I think, a challenge to all of us, uh, whether we're in religious leadership or secular leadership or educational leadership or whatever leadership we're in, I do think there are, there's an important role for leadership in all of this. Because without a kind of tuned in leadership uh, that's going to shape the public square rather than the public square or public squares being shaped by other forces, all of us are going to have, if we see ourselves in any sort of leadership role or community role, whatever that role may be, I do think that the, if, if we're trying to connect public life with religious life, then it just doesn't happen on its own. It does require, I think, certain dimensions of leadership. So there are five elements there. Okay, so we better crack on, as they say. Um, so the first element is the research, the empirical research that I'm referring to. So I was very fortunate to be asked by the all-party parliamentary group on faith and society, uh, chaired by Sir Stephen Timms, um, MP for East Ham, uh, to do some research about how partnerships between local authorities and faith groups uh, had evolved as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and there were two reports. Uh, the first report came out a couple of years ago and the second report um, came, just was published just a couple of weeks ago. And I do apologize in advance for those of you sitting at the back, some of this text will be small. So if you want to sit closer to the front, please feel free to do so. It's like it's that horrible thing is it, when the vicar says, don't sit at the back, come and sit at the front. But you know, as long as you can see, that's fine. I will, I will be reading out what, what's there. Uh, so the first report was Keeping the Faith, Partnerships between faith groups and local authorities during and beyond the pandemic. And then the second report was embedding a new normal in partnerships between faith groups and local authorities during and beyond the pandemic. So one of the ideas that I think hope, hopefully holds this uh, set of ideas together is that pre-pandemic, we were all shaping our public life according to the old normal. And the old normal, I think, you could have defined as hierarchical, bureaucratic, uh, technological, but not necessarily in a good way, uh, very bound by kind of protocols um, and language that nobody outside the institution understood. The new normal that emerged during the pandemic was much more was much less hierarchical, much more fluid, uh, much more based on relational capital, and much more based on shared values. And so I'm going to tease out what the old normal and what the new normal might look like. And to say that, going back to my idea of leadership, if we want, to if we want this new normal to carry on, because the, the, let's, let's be honest, the pandemic was an awful experience for so many people, and yet, some incredibly creative, innovative things happened that nobody thought could happen. 
And if we want to stay on that side of the, of the coin, as it were, then we're going to have to fight for it because the old normal will want to creep back as quickly as it can. And I would go for, so far as to say that all the pain and suffering that people have gone through is in danger of, of, not, of not giving hope. And, and Helen said to me, she said, Chris, whatever you do, fill people with a bit of hope. So I hope I will do that. But what I'm saying is that we're going to have to fight for that hope. It's not just going to happen. You may think, well, the pandemic was, you know, it did blow everything apart. But how can we work to make sure it's just not a one-off event, but something that, you know, allows us to develop new trajectories, new understandings, uh, new imaginations of the sort of society that we want to build, going back to what Paddy was saying. Um, so just I'm going to talk a little bit about the research, if that's all right, and just give you a sense of the sort of things we did. So this first report, we actually managed to get in touch with all 408 local authorities in the UK. And we devised quite a comprehensive survey because we wanted to know in quite some detail what were the partnerships that were evolving, you know, what were the areas of, of common work, um, but also what difference did that make? So it was both a survey and some interviews. So it was what we call mixed methods. And um, we got a very good response rate. Actually, 48% of local authorities responded. Give, you know, remembering this was in the height of the pandemic. This was like June and July of the first lockdown. People really wanted to talk about it. And you know, the headline figures from that survey, um, local authorities said we had, you know, it generally said we had a positive and expanding experience of what it was like to work with the faith sector, with people of faith. 67% um, of local authorities reported an increase in partnership working, so the pandemic obviously increased the level of partnership at one level. But it wasn't just the quantity, it was the quality of that partnership. So 91% said their experience of pandemic partnership working with faith groups slash FBOs, faith-based organisations, was very positive or mostly positive. And 76% said they intended to continue that partnership. They wanted that partnership to continue. Uh, they didn't want to just go back to the old normal, hierarchical, technocratic, uh, expert-driven, led way of, you know, responding to, to public need. So those were very positive uh, statistics. Some more positive statistics. We were interested in just the extent to which local authorities used the resources of faith groups during the pandemic. And 66 uh, local authorities, for example, involved faith-based organizations in the very important public message sharing around the pandemic, health messages, safety messages, um, but a whole range of other elements as well, you know, from the 40s to the high 60s. Local, it wouldn't be too, too much of a stretch to say that local authorities depended in many ways uh, for the swift um, response of faith groups, the professional response of faith groups, their ability to respond at scale, their ability to tap into networks that local authorities and other agencies couldn't. So all this has left a very favorable impression. And shifting perspectives, when we said um, we gave the local authority people 20 variables, 20 questions, Based on previous literatures around this area, some of which highlighted the positive aspects of religion in, in the eyes of secular people, uh, some of which highlighted the negative dimensions. But it's interesting that in this list, that the, the negative dimensions associated with faith groups, often with some justification, uh, lack of representation by women and young people, safeguarding concerns, socially conservative, the possibility of proselytization, all these are right at the bottom of the experience uh, of secular agencies working with faith groups. You would have expected them to be much higher up when we said, does this, character, does this characterize your experience of working with a faith group? At the top of that list, you've got much more dynamic, strategic, um, progressive, you might say, uh, agendas. So I think there is a shift going on from secular agencies that is 
prepared to move on from some of the baggage, shall we say, that's associated with faith groups and actually see, see what, what we share, what we share in common. And so the new, the new policy, this, this will test your eyesight at the back there, sorry about that. The, um, the, 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 this, I talked about the new normal in terms of policy. So we were able to identify three dimensions that emerged out of the first wave of the pandemic that would describe this new normal. So a deepening relationships between faith and secular actors, a willingness to share innovation and resources, and a commitment to developing a more inclusive framework for partnership working that moved from delivery and dissemination to more strategic forms based on intentional co-production and co-creation. So this idea of not just seeing faith groups as faithful you know, deliverers of services and messages, but actually seeing them as an integral part of how you co-create responses to very uh, wide-ranging problems. And top of the list of things that local authorities were wanting to explore, sharing with their faith communities, was working together to raise awareness of, ish of food justice and poverty, sharing best practice, between local authorities and faith-based organizations, increased resources to develop partnership working. This, of course, was only two years ago, and we wonder where that's gonna come from in the latest uh, budget white paper. But anyway, I don't think it's gonna be increased financial resources, unfortunately. Um, safe spaces for honest discussion about religion and belief. That's quite an interesting one. So an opening up of the space to talk about what really matters and not see difference as an obstacle to really getting to the heart of issues and innovation. Uh, the second report, uh, embedding a new normal in partnerships between faith groups and local authorities, uh, was, was all based on interviews basically between senior leadership of local authorities and faith groups. Um, we wanted them to reflect, to describe the nature of the partnership. So, the survey identified that partnerships had increased, but what did that actually mean? What, 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 was, what was behind that, that increase? So we got them to talk about describing the nat nature of partnership, who brings what to the table, reflecting on the extent to which COVID-19 had changed the relationship, describing the hallmarks of a good working relationship, and then three policy initiatives that they would want to see that might change the landscape in accordance with those principles. Clearly, the, the first lockdown, the first report, picked up on more or less, you know, totally the, 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 the extent to which the, 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 the emergencies facing society were around poop, food, isolation. So how do you get food to people who are isolated? How do you get food to people who can't get out to get food. So the existing issues around food poverty and food distribution were um, you know, exacerbated by the, by the pandemic. But as, as the kind of second and third waves moved on, then you see that social policy, those social policy areas of partnership expanding beyond simply the delivery of food and emergency food aid, uh, emergency. So mental health and well-being. There were lots of examples of partnerships between local authorities and faith groups around that, and I know uh, that that's the agenda close to, to Helen's heart and, and Leeds Church Institute's heart. Clearly, there have been rises in domestic abuse because people are in lockdown, refugee and asylum seeker support, and a list there of other... Um, I won't go through them all because I'm aware of time. Um, and there were... When you, when, you, when you asked a question, so what makes a good partnership? There were nine things, nine themes that crossed over between both secular and faith-based actors. So developing trust, cultivating transparency, sharing values, ethos, and motivation. Embracing new mindsets, including reimagining the structures of governance and finance. A commitment to talking honestly about conflict and misunderstanding a willingness to communicate regularly, coming with data-backed solutions. So don't just come with vague aspirations, come with solutions, come with data that's supported by data, 
local authorities really liked, liked it when faith groups did that. Developing shared goals based on shared values and action plans and telling good stories and celebrating achievements. So I just want to pick on one area where people really got engaged with this idea of, well, what would the new normal look like? Can we think of an area where um, we, we could imagine what this new normal looks like? And, and both the two areas that it really focused on was finance, so how is money distributed? And the second area was governance. But I'm going to focus on mindsets, on, on finance here, just to give you a flavour of some of the debates in this report. Um, a new mindset on finance. So the old normal around the way that councils fund things, with, when they use, particularly when they work with faith groups and other partners, many respondents regard the traditional funding models as no longer fit for purpose, purpose in a post-COVID-19 world. They're too static, they're too bureaucratic, they're too slow. What the pandemic showed was the, the beauty of, of you know, flexible, nimble responses. The current procurement model reinforces a static and embedded sense of hierarchy between experts and supplicants. The experts usually being the council, the supplicants usually being community groups. It favours instrumental and technical language that doesn't connect with faith communities or indeed possibly any communities. It often favours larger providers who can work to economies of scale or those who already have existing contracts. So this creates suspicions of favoritism and mistrust as the process is highly competitive. Local authorities have had their budgets substantially cut, so there's, mo there's no money to dispense anyway. And the whole relationship is deficit framed rather than growth framed. It's about chasing scarce resources rather than seeing the abundance of assets and resources that are already in the room. So a, 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 a way of reframing the whole issue of finance um, under what we might call the conditions of the new normal would be to start with the problems to be addressed and then come with possible solutions and action plans. One person from a faith, uh, a large faith um, provider said, funding is the last thing I ever talk about. Rather, when we begin our conversations with the council and with, between ourselves, we say, what is God calling us to do? What is the city calling us to do? And how are we responding to God's call? And the beauty of this approach, people said, was it immediately aligned the task of problem solving with personal and institutional core values, minimizing the danger of burnout and resentment. The call to local authorities, which some of them recognized, was to invite them to ask the same sort of questions about between themselves and with their partners, but without the God language. So what is the city calling us to do? How are we responding to that call? And to do this in parallel or shared spaces with their faith communities. So there was a general agreement that starting from the position of call rather than the position of, position of resources releases new energies and thinking indispensable to the needs of the moment and the challenges that are facing us. I really love this quote. This comes from a, somebody, a, a, you know, a manager, a leader in a local authority. I don't want to be problem solving all the time because economically it's a waste of money. Instead of putting sticking plasters on stuff, we want to swim upstream. And let's not get hung up too much on labels or channels by which we are doing this work. So the conclusion to, my, to the second report is, I think COVID-19 has heightened the need for a more authentic, participatory, and dynamic form of governance and decision-making that is both pragmatic and flexible, but more explicitly values-led. There is increasingly coherent support for the idea of experimenting with a values-led rather than a purely financially-led economy. In a values-led economy, outcomes are framed with perhaps unusual words, uncovered by this data, 
to describe the hallmarks of a good partnership between local authorities and faith groups. Words such as kindness, empathy, compassion, motivation, hope, that word, and friendship. So these were the words that people used about each other and what they valued about the partnerships that they'd made and saying we need to start with these, with this relational understanding of what, what we are as a society, what we are as, a, as humanity. So I'm raising the question, is there still a, uh, is there a possibility that this still new and unfamiliar vocabulary or lexicon might nevertheless come more into the policy mainstream as the UK attempts to build back better after COVID-19? Well, if Paddy's opening remarks or anything to go by, the answer to that is probably no, but we can but hope. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now from the, from the research and talk about, so I talked a lot about values um, emerging out of these partnerships in response to the pandemic. I think there's a wider uh, zeitgeist, spirit of the age, that is also driving this search for values, which I think is enormously important for faith groups and something we should be celebrating and working with. Um, one of the key drivers, I think, for the search of values is, is Generation Z, the post-millennials, of which now, again, a lot is being written about. Um, so let's, talk, let's, let's just focus on them a little bit and see whether their, their viewpoint is, is shaping this debate in some way. So the definition of, of a Generation Z person is someone born after 1996, and of course, if you're born after 1996, you're in totally immersed in a digital world, not an analog world like people like myself. Online and offline worlds are interchangeable. The digital provides endless opportunities for self-expression, telling the story of me and belonging. Who are my fam? Who are my squad? Where do I find partnership relationship? Um, there's huge granularity and fluidity in how in identities are being constructed and updated. This is the world in which we now are now living, updating fluid identities. And yet what holds all these searches together is this search for authenticity, finding out the real me, being authentic, but then also allowing others that same right. And values that can support this are respect, tolerance, transparency and honesty, which reminded me of some of the values we picked up in the research I was doing between local authorities and faith groups. Now, there is some, there's some, I was just reading some research today, we need to take some of this with a bit of a pinch of salt because there is another side to the Gen Z experience, which is around cancelling culture and, and that kind of authenticity being something that can be quite exclusive but it's also inclusive. And personal beliefs and values provide a sense of stability and reassurance that we used to find in institutions. So that's classic postmodernism. We no longer look to institutions, well, some of us do for a certain age, probably, to provide that stability and sense of guidance. It's now much more related to your own individual search for authenticity and meaning. So, are values the new religion? If they are, then, they're, they're, then they are the new sources of motivation and identity. These are really important things that we need to grapple with. Values are everywhere. Rainbow flags, pride flags, schools, corporations, British values. We won't go there. Save the NHS. Um, and I'm, I'm borrowing here from the work of Linda Woodhead. She says the rise in culture wars were really, it's the rise in values wars. And the younger you are, the more likely you are able, you'll be able to articulate what your personal values are. So there's a kind of seismic ethical moral shift going on in our society from give your life, a Christian ethic, to live your life. Being who you are meant to be and doing that and doing what only you can do in this life Life itself has become a value. A lot of the kind of 
reason why people define themselves as no religion or non-religious is because of clearly issues around sexual abuse in church, you know, its, its inability to live up to its own moral code, being preachy out of touch. And the key insight that I think is deeply challenging to all institutions, but maybe particularly religious ones, is you can be good without being religious. So the shift of moral responsibility to each individual. The values of the church, as Linda Woodhead, are no longer credible, but equally our faith in science and rationalism has been deeply shaken, a moral rather than scientific disaffection, she's saying. So post-millennials and the, re the renewed search for values, just a couple of quotes, Gen Zers, Gen Zers, feel the need to be honest, not hypocritical, especially in relation to ethnic and gendered communities with which they identify and therefore claim belonging. Post-millennials tend to be skeptical about institutions and are largely disillusioned with what they have inherited from their elders and feel the burden to sort out the messed up world they have inherited. So there's a huge moral and ethical, I think, dimension to the search for values, as well as what we might call a kind of cultural search for authenticity and re-enchantment. Now, I realize I'm really going behind time here. So lots of stuff around spiritual hinterland of, of nuns, not time to do that. Maybe this one's quite good. So um, Theos, I think, I'm not sure it's come out yet, but there was a, a piece in The Guardian covering some research they've done on the religion of the nuns. Um, they did a, a, a poll of 5,000 people. 53% said identified as non, no religious. But only 50% of those people said they do not believe in God. 20% um, believe in an afterlife, 17% believe, believe in the power of prayer. And I quite like this typology. There, there are the campaigning nuns, uh, hostile to religion. Nunness is part of their identity. So you'll never, ever, ever get there, engage with those people. Although having said that, you know, they, they like I, they, they, there's an intellectual debate about all this, around all this. Spiritual nuns, I don't belong to a religion, but I believe stuff. Tolerant nuns, generally atheistic, but see the value of religion. Uh, so it's a very fluid landscape out there. It's not at all binary, very fluid, fluctuating. And I think lots of exciting dialogues, a space for lots of exciting dialogues, encounters. This is where the hope lies, I think. You know, going with the grain of this and uh, not renouncing our values and who we are, but actually being proud of who we are alongside everyone else being proud of who they are. Um, Post-secular public square, I don't need to go too much onto this. It's not me that's saying it. Uh, it's a very uh, highly eminent and renowned um, social you know, uh, philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, I'm sure some of you in this room have come across his work, who coined the phrase the post-secular right at the beginning of the millennium, because he could see the way that the cusp between the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century was going. Religion was re-emerging as a very powerful geopolitical force and totally, if you like, upending the kind of a secularist teleology that just would assume that the 1960s would, would carry on forever. Uh, so he says, we need a new imagination of the public square in which the vigorous continuation of religion in a continually secularizing environment must be reckoned with. So he's not saying that the religion will, will replace the secular, but he's saying we've got to get used to a new kind of understanding of how the two in, are now interrelating, because neither of them are going away anywhere fast. Um, and I think the positive things about this idea, because it's been run with, it's been critiqued, but for me, it, it indicates that the barriers between religion and the secular are becoming more blurred and porous, although, of course, as well as becoming more essentialized. So actually, there, is, there are two things going on in our society. Religious identities are hardening, but they're also softening. Secular identities are hardening, but they're also softening. Anatheism. Doing God after God. I may need to go five minutes over. Helen, I do apologize. Um, but I, I think I like this idea of anatheism because in a way it's a kind of intellectual framework which begins to 
capture all that I've been talking about empirically and sociologically. And remember, we're talking about the context of Western thought here. So the death of God, you think of atheism in, in modernity, has liberated a new search for God. Disenchantment of nihilism, which Weber and Nietzsche foresaw, said it would drive us mad. If we give up belief in God, we'll go crazy. They were right. But that disenchantment is being replaced by a sense of re-enchantment or a desire for re-enchantment. The search for the sacred. So in Richard Carney's sphere, we've been moved from theism, atheism, and now into anatheism. So what does he mean by anatheism? In its atheist gaze, in its atheist guise, anatheism is saying goodbye, a departure, leaving a farewell to the old god of metaphysical power, the god we thought we knew and possessed, the omni-god of sovereignty and theodicy. Adieu, therefore, to the god that Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx declared god, dead. But he's saying adieu to the omni-god. Anatheism opens the option of a god still to come, or a god still to come back. So Anna, in anatheism, has two A's, the double A of ab and ad, Latin, a move towards and a move away from. The ab deo of the departure from God opens up the option of an ad deum, or return to God after God. A supplementary move of aftering and overing. Please don't ask me to explain what he's talking about, but there's somehow, I think, a sense in those words that he's describing something that's quite ineffable, but actually quite hard to pin down. Typical philosopher of religion, you might say. But as soon as the before and after God becomes fixed or fixated, we need to deconstruct this latest fetish and go after God again. I'm not spending too much time there because that, that's post-structuralism and we probably don't want to go into post-structuralist theology just at this stage. Um, so William Temple, to end on William Temple, because I think although he's thinking, you know, he died in 19... 44, 80 years old. Can, can William Temple, this great social, Anglican social uh, ethicist, thinker, have anything to say into this situation? Um, so I, I, I don't, I, mean, I want to temper all this kind of, you know, fluffy, warm, woolly, warm, fuzzy stuff with a bit of realism. I think we need a bit of realism in the room. So Temple's very clear that, you know, original sin is alive and kicking. Because, and, and, and what its main purpose is, is it, it precludes an ability to see beyond our own horizons and needs. So original sin means we can only ever see our need, we can't see the needs of others. And if I'm claiming that somehow we're moving into a new public space where we're, we're, we're open to sharing values and identities and, and narratives, well, are we? All institutions are provisional, church, state, society, under the guise, the, the horizon of eternal judgment, but nevertheless, the incarnation and the doctrine of creation call us into a relationship of love with God. So that's the kind of underpinning of all, I think, engagement in public life. Because we're called into a relationship with God, we're called into a relationship with our brothers and sisters. And for him, he's very clear, we're called, therefore, as a church and individuals to exercise agency, responsibility, and integrity in bending human society towards the principles of God or the kingdom of God or what he called the commonwealth of value. So what I like about Temple and what I think he brings to the table in this kind of new, very rapidly sh um, shifting, but, but I think still hopeful space is a mixture of prophetic truth telling, pragmatism and policy headlines. Uh, which were made very plain in his book, Christianity and Social Order, came out 80 years ago, at the end of which he says, I think it's called something like a suggested program. And basically you've got the, the, you've got the, the, the future comprehensive and universal welfare state laid out on three pages because he said, if, if you believe in the love of God, that we're called into a relationship with God, then what sort of society do you want to create that reflects that vision? So I, I'm not going to go into that now because I, there's not time. Um, but, because I've, I've reached the end of my time. A, a, but a, a, key, a key part of his thinking was, 
So if we're called into fellowship with God through love, then what that means is that we're called to respect the freedom of everyone, including our own, respect every person simply as a person. We're called to fellowship, rather old fashioned word, I prefer the word solidarity. We create, whereby we create the conditions of dialogue and relationship with others. And it's through that dialogue and relationship with others that we find our sense of completeness. And so very important for him was this idea, and I'm gonna end it here, of this, this idea of intermediate groupings. These spaces of human interaction that, that lie between the state and the individual. And he says that it's in intermediate groupings that we develop a sense of moral reciprocity that the good social order relies on. Uh, I'd like to send this message to all our political leaders. We feel as though we count for something and that others depend on us. And thus the state should safeguard the liberty that fosters such groupings. So a question I've got really to end on is, um, where, where are these intermediate groupings in today's society? Where are these places of encounter where we can learn to share values, put values into operation, where we can learn to value the identity of others as well as our own, where we can um, begin to test out and develop what this new normal might look like. And this comes to, I think, the role of leadership. These spaces, these intermediate groupings, and we could maybe talk about where they're, where they're cropping up in Leeds. Where are these intermediate groupings where these things are happening? Because they will be happening. And I believe that the church faith has huge resources to offer this curation of what I'm calling these spaces of, spaces of hope. Um, because so much of what people are looking for is what religion can offer already, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, the search for uh, something that lies beyond ourselves. But I don't think we can just expect people to come and place their bottoms on the pews. It's, it's, gotta, be, it's gotta be spaces almost outside those spaces. So what, what does anatheistic leadership look like? What does leadership look like when you're trying to work with this idea that people are searching for God after God they're, not, they're not, perhaps not even aware that they're searching for God. Scan the horizon, look for signs of the event and the messianic. Seeing the secular within both the sacred and vice versa, um, but not all, but also seeing something that's beyond simple binaries. Uh, chaotic, this idea of emptying of an institutional perspective in order to let new perspectives emerge. That was key to what made relationships and partnerships happen at the local authority faith group level. At some point, someone had to stand back and say, I'm not the expert, I hold my hands up, I don't know the answers to everything. I need your help, come and help me. Come and share your insights and your expertise. Modeling relationality, authenticity and partnership. Creating hospitable and safe spaces for the practical sharing and application of beliefs, values and worldviews. Leadership as curation, posse rather than potestas. So if you know your Latin, potestas is the sort of power that kind of, you know, wants to, it's the old normal power, it's the power that wants to dominate, it's the power of the empire, it's the power of hierarchy, it's the power, power of technocratic expertise. Posse is something that's about working with potential, uh, what's already there, it's soft power rather than hard power. You've been fantastic. Thank you for listening. I've gone well over my time. Thank you very much. Hey Chris, thank you hugely um, for that uh, fascinating talk. Uh, I have to confess, I'm a philosopher of religion and in no way a sociologist. 
And uh, we philosophers of religion are quite a simple-minded people. So uh, please excuse me for what will probably be uh, a very naive and um, un uninformed response. <clears throat> Uh, but I'd, I'd like to draw attention to three features of your talk that I really appreciated. Um, and the first uh, is the emphasis on hope. Um, and you mentioned hope, I think, maybe three or four times uh, in your talk, but it was really there as an essential uh, feature of it. And yet, at the same time, hope was not really... Um, just a simple case of optimism. It wasn't just a case of thinking, well, maybe things will be okay in the end. There was a real sense of the fact that we need uh, to fight for what we hope for. We need to fight for a better future. Um, and that seemed like a really important thing to me because I think so often what we see now is probably really a, a state of despair or a state of having given up um, often we see all these bad things around us and, and we don't really know what to do about it and there doesn't seem to be any other option. So um, the call to hope is a really important one and I think it takes courage to hope. Um, but it's not an automatic process either um, and I think you really highlighted that, that, that we have to fight for this hope. We have to fight for what we hope for. We can't just assume that it will fall into our laps. The second thing, um, coming from the uh, religious tradition that I come from and the philosophical tradition I come from, and having one foot uh, particularly in the kind of uh, Aristotelian tradition, is the sense that people have spiritual yearning and a search for values. And at least in the Aristotelian tradition, um, that's because of the kind of animal or the kind of creature that humans are. So it's not just the case that uh, humans could be any kind of creature. They're actually created to be a certain way. Um, and part of the way that they are created uh, is to have this spiritual yearning and to have this search for values. So um, in a way, it shouldn't surprise us if we think of human beings uh, in that way, as uh, Aristotelians, for example, Thomas Aquinas have done. Uh, if we find that even people who aren't within religious traditions uh, do have this spiritual yearning and do have this search for value. And I think related to that, you talked about the way that uh, certain, perhaps certain kinds of disruptions, such as COVID, could be potentially transformative for us uh, because they um, make us ask existential questions, they help us to cultivate compassion for others, and they really um, can act as a catalyst for spiritual yearning and as a catalyst for search for values. Um, and the third thing that I, I really appreciated uh, and that resonated with me deeply um, was the uh, emphasis on anatheism. Now, my name is Anastasia, so I really liked uh, the etymological uh, aspects of that. Um, but also, I'm not familiar with the language of anatheism. I hadn't really come across it before very much. Um, but it put me in mind a lot of uh, the mystical tradition um, and of people like Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. Um, don't ask me what an Areopagite is. But one of the things that the mystics talk about quite a lot is how the shattering of our images of God are really important for union with God, ultimately. Um, so you mentioned people like Freud and people like Marx, and perhaps one could take the, those people as, um, as friendly critics of religious belief precisely because what they're doing is to shatter our images of what a false god, what an idol is like. Um, and it's only through that uh, that we can uh, grow spiritually, that we can develop and grow spiritually. I did have a couple of questions as well. Um, I'm not sure if you want to answer my questions or, or other questions. Um, so either is fine, but I'll put the questions out there. And uh, one question is that you talked about uh, co-creation of responses and particularly kind of secular organizations 
and religious organizations. Um, and wor one worry I had is that that might detract from the responsibility of the government and state. Um, so one thing we were talking about over, over dinner, uh, you weren't talking about it, but I was talking about it at my table, um, was that there's a, um, a thing at the moment where barbers, so male hairdressers, are learning to be mental health workers to some extent. So they're given training uh, to help men's mental health so that a man could go along to have their hair cut and they might be asked how they are and actually they receive uh, mental health support and that seems like a really good thing right like, like no one could possibly think that's a bad thing but might the existence of these kinds of initiatives actually mean that the government says okay well these men are getting their mental health support uh, via hairdressers so we don't need to provide mental health support on the NHS anymore so that's what one worry I had about this kind of co-creation of responses um, and the second question I had, um, which relates to the fact that I, um, we had a Brazilian friend staying with us uh, recently, and he was uh, watching everything that's going on in UK politics. Brazilian politics has been pretty interesting over the last few weeks too. Uh, so he was watching both at the same time. And he couldn't understand why we weren't on the streets protesting. Um, he couldn't understand uh, what he, he kept th thinking there was a protest outside his window in Leeds and then he'd go out and it was like a, a 10k marathon or something like that. There was no protest going on. It's like, why aren't you calling for a general election? Like we would be, we would be going crazy here. Um, so my question is really what can we do to make uh, the new normal a good one because it could so easily become uh, the opposite. Thank you. Thank you, Tasia. We'll give Chris a few minutes to think about that. Um, I'd also like to add my thanks for that lecture. I'm Helen Reid. I'm director of Leeds Church Institute. I'm also a trustee of the William Temple Foundation. So I'm familiar with Chris's work, but I felt tonight was a fantastic combination of different aspects, speaking about research, speaking about um, social policy, speaking about theology. Um, so I think bringing those themes together is a great delight. Um, 